I'm sure actually people here know far more about the show than I do. Actually. Right, so has anybody got a question? Yeah, and, and if we don't know the answer, our friend Hugh Cecil will know the answer. Yeah. So if we can't answer it, I'll give you Hugh's phone number. You can phone right. <laughs> right, anybody got a question? One at the back here. Somewhere? Yeah? Thank you. Sorry? Which was your favourite episode of Why? Oh, I think you know, the one we just seen, the Royal Train. I, I just think we had such sort of fun going up and down the railway line like, <laughs> like that. Although it was very hazardous, I do have to say, because, as you realise, the train was sort of bearing down on us. Ian was supposed to be uh, driving, but of course uh, he can't drive a train, so the guy who was driving it had to keep out of sight. And Bill Berkeley suddenly said, my God, that train's gaining on us. It's going to run us down and they can't see us. We're all going to have to jump and we're going at about 60 miles an hour. And I said, we'll break our legs. He said, well, we're, otherwise we'll be killed. He said, and we nearly all jumped, actually. But fortunately, we found out afterwards they were in um, walkie-talkie radio control, so it was all all right. I have to say, I think he goes back further than I do. I mean, I was only in the third series. He was in the first two, weren't you? That's right. Yes, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. My gosh, there you go. Any more questions? <laughs> oh, come on. Somebody must Tell have me. a question. So you know, um, when you did a series, uh, it, which took a year, or it, it, you, within a year, but how long did that actually take? Was it, week, was it like, say, eight weeks, for, or say, six weeks for six episodes, or did it go on all summer, or what? Well, I don't know what it was like at the beginning. Um, what, did you, what did we do at the beginning? Yes, right at the beginning. Um, it, uh, as far as I can remember, we, we, we started off, uh, the very first shots were done at uh, Thetford um, on location. And we were dashing around like, um, well, you know what. Uh, we didn't quite know what we were doing or how we were doing it. Um, there was a general air of, uh, how shall I say, I mean, um, uh, Jimmy Perry and, um, what's his name? Um, David Croft. David Croft. <laughs> they knew what they were doing. Uh, but, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. But um, the, the thing was, we, we were supposed to be this newly formed LDV, and uh, there was a bit of chaos and confusion. Now, I was actually in the um, LDV, in, uh, in London when it first started and um, we were quite organised. Our headquarters was the local TA headquarters, so we had everything at our fingertips, except of course the uniforms and the arms and the ammunition. But um, I, I, I think the chaos that was um, created in the early couple of episodes of Dad's Army was, um, well, it was very entertaining, but it wasn't quite like that. I mean things in the Home Guard, or the LDV as it was then, um, things were quite well organised. I mean, um, if you go back to the film, uh, when they um, hear the broadcast, that they were going to form the uh, local defence volunteers, and uh, Arthur Lowe says, right, uh, follow me lads, and he walked them out of the police station across the road to somewhere else, and they all signed these bits of papers and he said, well, I will be captain of, of this little lot. And as you saw last week, uh, John Ringham saying, well, you were never promoted, you were never appointed, you were never gazetted, you know, so you, you, you're busted down to um, um, a private, as it were. And of course, the last, the last shot of him, uh, Arthur Lowe offering his penknife to John the Missouri and saying, well, you may need these kind of stripes off. I thought that was rather nice. But, um, you know, no way would anyone have sort of jumped into the breach and said, right, I'm in charge, you know, follow me. Um, it was organised. But um, the script, um, the script writers did a wonderful job on that. And uh, the state of confusion, I mean, with... Um, with Mr. Jones, the butcher. You know, it's the cold steel, you see, so they don't like it happen. Well, I was in the Royal Warwickshire Regiment, and I don't remember the regiment be, being in that part of Egypt at the time when he was talking. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, I mean, the, um, the fact is that uh, it's rather nice to know that Mr. Jones was in the Royal Warwickshire Regiment, as I was, and Enoch Powell, and one or two other people.
Uh, so I'll answer your question. <laughs> uh, well, someone, I just, what I was getting at was how long did it go on for? Well, well I mean, was I think what, eight months? what we used to do, we used to go and do um, Fortnite's um, location filming. Um, and, I, and, and it was a wonderful time because we were up in Thetford, as, as you said, and, uh, and it was a marvellous time there because we ran around the fields, we drove Jones's van, we hung on to the end of a barrage balloon, we chased up and down a, a railway track. We had to move to somewhere where there was a railway line for that. But basically we're on this battle area for two weeks. Then we come back and we do the six or seven episodes in the studio, in front of an audience, feeding in the uh, location filming that we'd done at the appropriate moment. So what we'd do all the interior stuff and we'd have a week's rehearsal for that. So I suppose basically if we were doing seven episodes we'd have a fortnight's uh, filming in Norfolk then we'd have seven weeks in the studio. So it'd be about um, nine weeks work and that would produce seven episodes. But then of course they'd have to go on and uh, edit them but all the other stuff would go on. But as far as the actors are concerned, two weeks filming and then an episode a week um, for that particular series. And that was all live audience watching that? Sorry? And that was an all, all live audience watching that in the studio? Yeah, well, that was sort of live, yes. I mean, <laughs> you know, sometimes you'd think, oh gosh, they've gone to sleep, they're not laughing. But, I mean, no, they were live, they were there, they were fit and proper people and um, um, I think Bill Perkley used to do a sort of warm-up for the audience, yes, yes. didn't he? That's yes, right, yeah. Yes, yes. yes, he did. And, uh, and then I think occasionally we've got someone else in to do well, the warm-up, right, yes. Bill had got a lot to do in the programme. Yes, um, yes, I can remember one or two other people doing the warm-up. Yeah. But yeah. on one occasion, um, when they were sort of handing out tickets for the, uh, for the audience participation, I remember phoning home and saying to my wife, well, are you coming down this evening? And I said, I've got some tickets for you. So she said, yes. So she came down with my son and daughter, and a friend of mine came down with his wife and their two kids. And we were in the canteen having a meal, and Jimmy Mack, who was in the series, uh, he said, well, look, if I'd have known there were so many of you, we could have brought the show to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's very much a family show, actually. People oh, did, um, uh, and I mean, I have to say, when we were on location, um, um, the, the wives were all around, if you, if you know what I mean. I mean, um, Joan Cooper, Arthur Lowe's wife, would be on location, and Althea Ridley, who would um, sort of look after the Arnold. I mean, in the early days, it was okay. By the time we were finishing, he said something like, uh, I used to do a lot of running about in the first episodes. I can't run about quite so much now, when he was 80-something or whatever he was. But Althea used to... Uh, his wife used to look after him wonderfully, and I mean, she's a wonderful person. And so the wives actually became part of the family, and that was wonderful because I'm still in contact with them. I was at a do the other day, Dalthea Ridley was there, Kay Beck was there, uh, Joan Le Majurier was there, and so you know, even those who've died, their wives are still part of it which is wonderful, part of the family. And of course, Gladys Sinclair, Teddy, dear Teddy's wife, a um, wonderful person. Any more questions? Frank, you used to um, travel with uh, Teddy quite a lot, I believe, to, to and from location and everything. Yeah. Have you got any funny stories about him? Well, Bill Perk, we will always embellish these stories, but I mean, <laughs> Teddy was not... Not, I suppose, the most concentrated driver that ever was. And I do remember going up to Thetford one day, and Teddy's driving away, and he said, Well, now, Frank, you have to look out for... I, I can see properly, don't you? have to look out for exit 30 or something. And I said, Well, this is 31. Are we going in the right direction? He said, Oh, I think so, yes, we're going backwards, 31. And I said, well, this is 32 now. Oh, dear, he said, well, we've got this wrong. So he then tries to do, uh, he doesn't quite try to do a U-turn on the motorway, but tries to find the way off in order to go back in the other direction. And blow me, we nearly missed it, it's at 30 again. Because he had, Bill's got all these stories about how he used to spread the map out so that he couldn't see through the windscreen. I think that's a bit of an exaggeration. But uh, Teddy was, um, um, yeah, I mean, he was a bit vague about certain things. And I can remember once being on location 
he, he said, but we were at the hotel, they were all moving on. And I, for some reason, had got the morning off or I was going, I'd finished my stuff, I was going home. Anyway, I wasn't with them. And suddenly, the manager of the hotel came and said, well, oh, can somebody take a phone call? Um, and so I, I was sitting next to Jimmy Beck at the time. And we both said, oh, well, yeah, what's it all about? And he said, oh, it's Teddy Sinclair. Jimmy Beck said, you cope with that one, Frank. And it was Teddy having broken down somewhere and could we please get a message to somebody? And it was all very complicated. And Teddy was a very sort of um, earnest person who liked to get everything right, but occasionally things went terribly wrong for him. But I loved Teddy very much. He was a super person. Great family man. Very fond of it. I mean, his wife and his two sons were absolutely the centre of his life. Any more questions? Yes, I'd like to uh, ask you, uh, Frank, the, the, the series has become very popular again now with all the repeats, and it started off not so well, and then gained in popularity. What was the view of the actors and involved in it as it gained this popularity? Well, uh, do you know, I do have to say, even though it was gaining its popularity, I'm not sure that we were tremendously aware of that. I mean, we were aware that we were doing a very successful series. I don't think we were quite aware that we were into what I think Bill Perpy has described as television legend. And I mean, it really is one of the most successful programmes ever made by the BBC, I should think. Yes. And it's extraordinary. I don't think one was aware that one was doing that at the time. One knew it had become popular and one enjoyed doing it. But I, I don't think we... I mean, I don't think I was going to be told... I didn't think in 28 years' time or... A couple of years ago, I, I met a, a, a friend of mine who said, meet your youngest fan. And he introduced me uh, to his three-year-old granddaughter. And he said, she prefers Dad's Army to Postman Pat. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's a great accolade, but I don't really believe it. So this little thing, when she'd sort of got used to me, they'd showed an episode where I'd have to, I had a row with Mannering about um, the office. And she suddenly said, tell me, that desk, is it yours or is it Captain Maverick's? <laughs> and I was out of the mouth of a three-year-old who thought 28 years ago we were going to have three-year-old fans in 28 years' time. Wonderful. Wonderful. Any more questions? Yeah, what, uh, what do you think about the film? I mean, uh, you know, personally, I think it's a good well, film. Well, right no, well, I mean, I think... The first thing I want to say about the film is I cannot believe they could be so stupid as to uh, as not to use Janet Davis yeah, as Mrs. Yeah, Patton. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think yeah, this was yeah. disgraceful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was an appalling thing to do. And, uh, and uh, this is nothing against Liz Fraser, who's a friend of mine who I think is a lovely actress and who was perfectly fine. But everybody knows Mrs. Pike was Janet Davis. So that was... Um, and of course, when you have a film, you have to <coughs> lengthen something into a longer sequence. And it was a bit bitty in a sense. It, it didn't quite contain the, um, the sort of momentum that, uh, that a half hour uh, show could, uh, could, could do. So I don't think it worked quite as well. But having said that, I do think it worked rather better than most uh, films that have come out of a, 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 a TV comedy series. Because I think most of them are absolutely dire. But I don't think Dad's Army is dire, but it's not as good as the series. I, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Did, did the cast ever change the script? Um, yes, there were one or two occasions. I mean, where, uh, I think Ian Lambert sort of said recently that uh, people got to uh, Jimmy and David got to write for the characters and I think that was true and therefore I think if if the characters suddenly got something to do in the script which uh, they felt wasn't right for their characters um, they would um, sort of say so and I think there was uh, the episode where um, uh, uh, the Jonesy has the uh, is it a grenade or a bomb um, 
up his um, yes. trousers. Yes. I think that was originally written for Arthur, and Arthur said, yeah. oh, no, no, I don't do that sort of thing. <laughs> it? And, uh, um, so I think uh, that was hastily rewritten for, for Jonesy instead. And uh, so there were little changes like that, but by and large, I mean, I think David and Jimmy so wrote for the characters, there really wasn't any necessity to... And it, it's interesting watching the black and white ones. You can actually see the characters feeling their way. Mm -hmm. And um, sadly, a number of the second series have been lost. But I, I think if you watch those, probably, one would find they're finding their way. And by the third series, they'd found it. And mm -hmm. they were actually writing for the characters. So you really didn't need to do much in the way of alteration. I've got one for uh, Ali. Yeah. You mentioned that you were part of the local events volunteers when we first started out. Um, did you watch the recent programme about um, the real iPhone guy? And, and he pointed out some of the incompetences uh, that actually no, happened. No, I, I didn't see that. And um, were you aware at the time that there was also a, like a secret home guard which really would have taken on any invasion? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. That it really belittled the home it, That was just a canvas sort of thing, the real That's home right, guard, yeah. You know. Yeah, it, it was felt that um, people like that knew their home ground more so than uh, regular troops would and these people were in fact um, specially trained for that. It was so secret that um, this sector didn't know that sector as it were, which was um, a, a, a very good idea. But the, uh, the Home Guard itself in um, taking control of its own areas was a much better idea rather than having, um, uh, how shall I say, um, a big firm or, or big works where they had their own home guard, all they would know about would be the um, location that they were working in. Whereas the home guard, the local people, knew the ins and outs of all the streets, the by lanes, uh, the shortcuts, and um, how shall I say, the woods and everything else. And um, basically, it was a it was a rather good idea because as a guerrilla force, um, yes, they're very good. Um, I, I I felt that. Um, the home guard as such, um, the actual home guard, uh, they were a bit restrained in as much that um, we used to have regular um, soldiers who were the permanent staff instructors. In the case of um, my battalion, um, they drew their staff instructors from the, um, from the guards who were uh, stationed in the Tower of London. And these blokes used to come up in the evening on a tram or a bus or if they were lucky, they got a lift, and um, they sort of dealt mostly with um, a ceremonial drill. Well, okay, um, you know, when I went into the army, I, I'd been in the cadets, I'd been in the home guard, I was a drill instructor in the home guard. It was rather silly that I was uh, 17, 18 years of age, and I was teaching men who had fought in the first war how to fix bayonets, the, 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 the new method of fixing it, because it had been changed. And, um, I was teaching them um, sort of um, uh, unit information and attacking and things, things that they didn't have in the first war. Because in the first war, it was just a question of um, out of the trenches, over the top, and go straight at them. But as we got into the second war, we found the flanking movements and, um, how shall I say, um, splitting a unit up and not in, not attacking in bulk in one point, but to have come in from various places. I, I can remember the place called Rolls Park Corner in um, where the birds of the feather... Uh, Chigwell. Chigwell, that's right. Rolls, Rolls Park Corner in Chigwell. We were doing an exercise there. And I said to my section, right, well we're supposed to be going up the hill to take the machine gun post which we believe is at the top of the hill. But we're not going up the hill. We went down onto the road. And the car came along. We ran into the road and stopped it and said, look, um, we're not commandeering the car or anything like that, but can you give us a lift? We want to get up to the crossroads so that we can come round behind these other blokes, you see? And I said, yeah, pilot. So we all piled into this car and off we went. And um, we, we got up to Rolls Park Corner, we got out at the crossroads. I said, okay, fellas, this way. And we came um, came across the fields and there were these blokes with this um, uh, Browning automatic um, in the slip trench and they were sort of peering in front of them. 
And I said, right, stick him up. And they turned around and said, what's this? I said, you captured him. And they said, but you were going to attack us from that way. I said, no, don't believe in <laughs> <laughs> You know, and it worked out quite well. And the CEO was quite happy about it. But he told us off because we'd stopped this car and had a, had a ride in from Russian Walk. <laughs> But that's the kind of thing Jimmy Perry and David Croft would have dreamed up, actually. I mean, I mean yeah. it's a very good story. I mean, yeah. you should have told them that, and we'd have had an episode about it. Because yeah. yeah. Jimmy, of course, was actually in the Home Guard uh, before he went into the Air Force as, I won't say as a stupid boy pike, but I'm... The, the cross belt was that of the Household Cavalry. It was the white belt with the red cord through it. So I phoned Bermans, or, well, I, I actually wrote to them and said, you know, how could one man be wearing a uniform of three regiments all in one? And he said, well, on the last day of the shooting at Zulu, someone had pinched the, the belt that had the South Wales Borders um, uh, badge on it, and uh, they'd lost the, um, the, the, the shoulder belt as well. So they, they just made it up. So um, that's how that came about. I mean, I'm sure it wouldn't be any member because it wasn't, fam it wasn't even formed there, but uh, people do actually want to pinch something that's been in a film. And I remember Mary Husband coming to me one day in despair and said, um, we were on location, she said, there's been a break-in and they've stolen your hat, she said to me. <laughs> the vicar's hat. And I said, well, the vicar will have to be hatless in this one. And um, I mean... Um, you, you know, things like that did actually happen, that uh, people wanted a souvenir, so they nicked something like the, like the vicar's hat or something. But Mary Husband was also the, um, the uh, costume designer on the other Perry Croft show, You Ran Me Lord, where I got promoted to being a bishop, didn't I? Mm. And she, I met her the other day and she said, I've got something for you. And she gave me the, the cross, which I wore as a vicar, uh, as a bishop, and, and, and the ring, which I wore as a bishop. So, um, you know, I'm very, very pleased with Mary Husband. Very kind, very kind lady. Yeah. I've got one for you, Frank, going back two years ago. Did you ever have a think and see what was written on the back of the spare harmonium? Uh, no, I don't think I'd better go into that. <laughs> but Clive Dunn says he hasn't done it recently, I believe. <laughs> Is there any more questions at all? Oh, sure. Yep. Um, what was your favourite question for both of you? Who was your favourite character in Dad's Army? Oh. <laughs> well. Yeah. Um, it probably was Clive Dunn, I should think, with all these silly little things that he used to think about and do. But then again, I mean, Ian Lavender had some nice little lines and. Um, even John Bazirian. Um Well, I, I, I think everyone went over very well. I, I've, I feel the same thing. I mean, I think it's almost an impossible question because it was yeah. so much a family and a team show that we all worked together so well. And I've got just very fond memories of all of them, really. I mean, you know, everybody says, was Arthur Lowe pompous? But he was a very kind and generous man, and um, you know, I quite often used to go out with him um, after the show, or, or when the show, when we'd finished filming, we still kept in touch with Arthur. We'd go out with him, and quite often he'd say, oh, I've, "I've done a commercial today. I'm, I've been um, uh, Mr. Schweppes or whatever." He, you know, I've earned a lot of money and meals on me tonight. He's very kind. John the Measurer, who just loved being vague all over the place. And <laughs> Clive Dunn, who, as you say, does all these dark things. <laughs> Ian, stupid boy. I mean, you, you could just go on. And of course, I was extremely fond of Teddy Sinclair. I mean, he, he was a wonderful character. And dear old Bill comes and shouts about the place. And John Laurie and Arnold Ridley trying to vie with each other to be the oldest. I mean, it's extraordinary. I mean, it's a wonderful, wonderful team. Loved them all. There's one thing about it. No one sort of got temperamental as you do no. with, 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 with some productions. Yes. Uh, usually there's someone who gets very temperamental and um, they go into a bit of a huff and they don't want to talk to anybody. But with Dad's Army, everybody was matey, 
They were all on good terms. And if they got out of bed the wrong side, they didn't sort of worry about it once they got to the, the rehearsal hall or the studio. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, I think that was the secret of its success in a way. We yes. all enjoyed working with yes. each other. Yes. Yes. And if we hadn't, I don't think it would have lasted as long as Because if they'd all hated each other, we wouldn't have lasted three, uh, three, three series. We wouldn't have, it wouldn't have lasted three series, let alone nine or ten or whatever we did. Oh, yeah. I well, mean, we would just have finished. Sorry? And it's not like practical jokes played on any of it. Well, there of one or two here and there. Yes, I suppose they were. I can't remember any particularly, but, uh, um, but of course, the wonderful thing was that when you, they were all um, recorded, so I mean it wasn't live television. I was talking to someone earlier about a, a previous incarnation when I was in a program called The Army Game, which was all live television. But uh, uh, this was um, all recorded, so if anything went terribly wrong, you could do it again. And I do remember a number of occasions when, I mean there's one where Arthur, I think, is trying to clear a and pulled through through a rifle. He ties it round the balusters, and the balusters break. Um, but I mean, this is, I mean that I seem to remember. We had to do about six times because, first of all, the balusters didn't break, and then they, they just stuck solidly and wouldn't go either way. And the, then the string break. I mean, the whole thing was the string break when it wasn't meant to, and the, uh, uh, so it was that sort of thing rather than anybody deliberately doing anything to, uh, to uh, you know, make practical mm. jokes. I mean, the, the one thing I do remember was uh, doing Arnold Ridley's This Is Your Life, which was all, uh, the, the, the sequence was that we were going to do a little advertising film for the stage tour. So we met at Marylebone Station by Eamon Andrews. Um, and so we were all dressed up and we all had to, and of course Arnold was the only one who didn't know why we were really there. So that was a sort of hoax on Arnold, but I, I mean the look of surprise on Arnold's face when suddenly he was in the middle of all this acting and Eamon Andrews came behind him and said, Arnold Ridley, this is your life. I mean, it was quite extraordinary. And then he said, I couldn't understand why. Althea kept saying, you must wear a clean shirt today. <laughs> so I kept saying, well, I'm going to be changing into uniform. So it never occurred to me I'd have to change back and go to the studio. <laughs> Any more questions? Did Arthur Lowe have difficulty in remembering those words? Sometimes you used to sit at the desk and you think he was reading some of the scripts from his desk. Well, I never, I, I never quite knew with Arthur. I mean, there's a story of um, uh, David Croft, uh, getting a bit exasperated with Arthur because he didn't uh, know the words at rehearsal one day. And he said, Arthur, don't you take the script home and learn it. And Arthur said, oh, no, 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 I wouldn't have rubbish like that in my flat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that was a joke. I, <laughs> I think that was a joke. But I, I mean, I think he did occasionally, but he managed to turn it into such a wonderful kind of um, and Wilson, and he sort of covered it up, and of course it was never too disastrous. He, um, he could just do it again. So, I mean, uh, we all have. I mean, I can remember having a one dreadful episode where I just could not remember certain lines, and I mean, it was a disaster. I mean, it was a disaster. But I had to keep going again and again on on, on me, and I. I remember I had to keep going to the Vicarage study window to speak to somebody, and I get there and I think I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> and they say, cut, and I say, I'm so sorry, and what's the line? And they tell me, and we'd have to do it again. So, I mean, it can happen to all of us.